All told, 2023 was decidedly not the year for adaptations of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, at least if public opinion and social media uproar were any indication. The real low point was the release of The Lord of the Rings Gollum, a video game title originally planned alongside another by the same studio that appears to have driven that studio into the dirt with its colossal failure and ridicule. The aim of the game appears to be, per the tagline on the back of the box, to tell an untold story. And I believe this is where I'm supposed to quip that this story should have remained untold, that we neither needed nor wanted a Gollum game. Some have said that. But I wanted this game. I was excited years ago when the concept was first pitched. There's a lot of reasons why that excitement was ill-informed. The model for downloadable content appears to have been created to be entirely exploitative of its player base. The graphics and all other elements of its visual design appear to be lacking in both style and visual fidelity rendered. This isn't entirely a negative perspective, of course. Some of the visuals are creative, and in one or two instances the fonts appear legible, which upon review is the least we could have hoped for. I like some of the voice acting in the game, which I didn't expect. Gandalf's voice in the narration is good, and I actually like his visual design. It's not something I can say for a lot of the elves and dwarves we meet. Gollum is a land of contrasts. The audio design of the Nazgul feels underwhelming, but the sequence where Smeagol tries to run away from them in the tunnels is genuinely a little spooky. After Smeagol is taken captive in Mordor, there's a weird section where a bunch of guys spit on you and then we get to do slave labor. That's not a joke, either. A not insignificant percentage of this game is spent in slavery, laboring as a slave, contemplating the death of slaves, befriending slaves, escaping slavery, etc. It's almost as if the game's designers had limited resources but wanted to fill the runtime of the game with something, anything. So they all sat down in a conference room, and after a pregnant pause, somebody said, Hey, what about 12 years of Gollum? That do anything for anybody? And the rest of the development team laughed so hard and for so long that by the time they wiped away their tears and got back up off the floor, they had developed an entire video game. I like to think that's how it went down. The designers spent a little too much time trying to be cute, getting all the orcs speaking black speech, the language of Mordor, but I liked the part where I got to eat worms. Mordor is kind of like hell, and Smeagol is kind of a weird little guy, but he has his charms. He reminds me of Beetlejuice in a way. He's kind of a trickster, he's got this whole arc in the original trilogy about how he doesn't say his own name, and it's Frodo saying it that really empowers him, at least his moral side. He's got kind of a sweet side that he hides beneath a frankly psychotic exterior. I listened to the Beetlejuice musical soundtrack recently, you know, the parallels are just piling up. Gollum just needs a little conversation, and I have mastered the art of tearing bad video games apart. I'm being serious, by the way. The game expends a ton of the player's interest and time and effort in slave labor. It's all slavery all the way down, which sort of makes it the perfect title for this era of the gaming industry. At the same time, there's too many undercooked mainstream titles like this for it to really be the Tommy Wiseau's The Room of video games. Instead, it's a tangled knot of wet noodles that won't come undone without breaking apart into something useless, undesirable, unintended. I can't make heads or tails out of what this game is trying to say. There's ostensibly some kind of poetic license being taken here with this character, but textually it's impossible to unravel. I have a tendency to at least try to see the best in the reviled and discarded, which is at once something everyone likes to think of themselves making it a narcissistic delusion, while also being a self-destructive delusion, because it means at some point you'll end up in a morass of garbage. Garbage people, garbage experiences, garbage lifestyles, garbage habits, garbage games. I kept wondering what it said about me that I would pay even the $15 I spent getting this game on eBay while it was still retailing for $50 digitally, and I think that's it. I'm the kind of person who can't explain her habits without being told I'm wasting my time by more or less everyone I know, and when I set out to make a brief, lighthearted essay about adapting Tolkien using only a single example from last year, I didn't think it would get bogged down in so much thinking. Maybe Gollum inspires me to think because it becomes purely a creative process to make something meaningful out of trash. Maybe this is a trash essay, because it will end up on YouTube or some other social media platform. In the words of Bennett Foddy in Getting Over It, Over time, we've poured more and more refuse into this vast digital landfill that we call the internet. It now vastly outnumbers and outweighs the things that are fresh, untainted, and unused. When everything around us is cultural trash, Trash becomes the new medium, the lingua franca of the digital age. You could build culture out of trash, 
but only trash culture. Be games, be movies, be music, be philosophy. But trash, I think, becomes anything discarded. This could be trash. One day I will be trash. I feel a kinship with trash. Where once we begin as a thing desired or born of desire, in beauty or ugliness, we end as trash. Discarded, returned to the earth from one mother to another. But for a video game about slavery, Gollum is not a game about death quite as much as one would think. There is death, certainly. There are undead Nazgul, dying slaves, the friends we sacrifice, the foes we vanquish, such as they are. But the game is only trivially concerned with these. They're all presumably asking the player to feel something, think something, conclude something, ponder something. Video games and games in general aren't anathema to this sort of provocation, but that doesn't make unraveling them easier when they're built like the underfed, greedy, repulsive miscreant that they purport to be about. I set out to complete an independent, off-stream playthrough of Gollum just to capture footage for this video. At one point in the game, I hit my second seemingly game-breaking bug and restarted repeatedly at the current checkpoint, thinking, eventually, like many modern games, this one would respawn me in a safe zone designated by default by the developers, but no such luck. Given this tragedy, I restarted the level only to have this same weird bug follow me. At best as I can tell, the game thought that I was in an earlier area of the game, because the lethal box underneath the current level also has some sort of crossover with the previous level, so it kept triggering the conversation from the previous level that I had with an NPC, whereupon it detected I was in the death zone under the map's platforming section. They're all more or less like this, some greener or redder than others. And so the game concluded the only logical thing it could. It immediately killed me and gave me a game over screen again and again and again. That's where this story ends. I wasn't sure what discourse in slavery Gollum was trying to play with, but I knew that as sympathetic as I find trash, I can only eat too much of it before I have to quit. Was it the fault of the developers for trying to make a game about this titular character at all? Was their decision to set so much of the game in Mordor the cause? Was the issue that the game was so thematically centered around slavery or so fixated on performing moral quandaries? I think those are all hasty, small-minded conclusions, but the game does raise serious questions, whether we like it or not, about adapting Tolkien's works, and it isn't the only release from 2023 to do so. On March 14th, on the official news and announcements section of the Magic the Gathering website, Wizards of the Coast teased their then-upcoming crossover trading card game set, Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. The set and its associated products included a booster set replete with highly sought-after alternate art cards, such as the one-of-a-kind One Ring card that caused no end of speculation, and paired starter decks, commander decks, unique display products, and many variants of so many of the cards contained within. The crossover had been highly anticipated, and was in the events leading up to the teasers at that time of year seen as perhaps the high point in an increasingly new attempt from Wizards of the Coast to draw in new players and please old ones by marrying other intellectual properties with the Magic the Gathering brand, and in the process giving players something that they could still use to play the game. The set was more ambitious because, while the Walking Dead or Warhammer 40k crossovers that came before it did have limited sought-after merchandise or playable decks, it also had a draftable set legal in other formats, such as modern and the number of cards contained within the set was judged by many to be ambitious. Of course, very little of that information will be something non-players can parse in the terms that will make it relevant to Magic players everywhere, and frankly, all of that is window dressing for the events that would follow. What's important to understand is that this was a new, if gradual, step for Wizards of the Coast in 2023, and the company had suffered in recent memory from poor image issues due in no small part to their apparent need to call the literal, actual Pinkertons on a customer who was, through no fault of his own, sent a product by a store before the product's release date. It's equally important for the uninitiated to understand that Magic players ordering cards before their release is astonishingly common even for a community of gamers, and that flubs like this are rare among communities that rely intensely upon each other for support both social and financial. While Wizards of the Coast has at times been praised for their fastidiousness in enforcing and thereby also protecting a positive social environment, such as when they banned Jeremy Hambly of the quartering due to his coordination of the harassment of a female magic cosplayer live on his stream and in a now-deleted but blissfully preserved upload, including unwarranted remarks of a sexual nature, they have additionally come under fire from creators large and small for their deranged willingness to ally themselves with real-life Red Dead Redemption villains, or their awkward repeated willingness to employ what grammar necessitates I describe as AI artists. 
To say Wizards of the Coast Court's controversy would be an understatement of devious proportions. Wizards of the Coast seems to require a controversy in order for its Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons teams to clock in every morning. Whether they will be the hero or the villain is entirely up to the whims of fate, or should I say, a roll of the dice. With all of that said, it was with all of the disappointment and confusion at the intentions of God as a draft player pulling a chase rare outside my colors from my third pack that I looked back and saw, in terms of media attention and player backlash, that the release of the Tales of Middle-earth set was seriously vying with the AI art and Pinkerton controversies for recent sources of critique of Wizards of the Coast, and it was for the dumbest and most sinister reason. If you look through the teasers for the products on the March 14th post that I mentioned earlier, you'll find one particular artifact that started all this controversy. Down under the heading for starter kits is a pair of previews for its two forward-facing display cards, Sauron, the Lidless Eye, and Aragorn and Arwen Wed. Notice anything about these cards? No? Do you give up? I promise you it's something stupid. You're really gonna hate it. Alright, I'll tell you. Look more closely at Aragorn. That's the controversy that lit the fuse that ignited a flame war under the version of this teaser posted to Mythic Spoiler, with players jumping down each other's throats about the color and identity of Aragorn. Now, usually when Magic players complain about the color and identity of a card, especially a legendary creature card, here denoted with the text immediately underneath the art, what they're actually complaining about is the card's literal color identity. You see, Magic is a game that features a great deal of self-expression tied to one's choice of strategy, with a lot of aesthetics in not just card art, but the frames and themes of the categories of the card. There are five colors in Magic the Gathering, those being white, blue, black, red, and green. A player who tends to build decks using the colors blue and black will, by virtue of the ideas and philosophies evoked by these colors, develop a different identity in their playgroup from a player who builds only red decks. This is a fun way of engaging with one's own identity and the identities of others in a manner bordering on artistic in and of itself, which of course will inevitably be taken to an awkward place by self-serious nerds. The set features several versions of Aragorn with various color identities representing his changing place in the story of the Lord of the Rings, from his role as a ranger, to his role as a commander of the United Forces of the West, to his wedding with Arwen, to his final occupation of the throne of Gondor. This is cool, and also not what people were mad about, because while in terms of Aragorn's color identity he is every color but black, in the racial sense he is here portrayed as a black man. You'd think that would be nothing for people who are casting cardboard lightning bolts at their opponents on a regular basis, but you'd be wrong. In the case of Aragorn specifically, the texts originally describe him as pale, yes, but there seems to be a serious misconception on the part of commenters in this flame war that black people just don't get pale. You guys know they have blood in their veins, right? Like they're human beings? They can look pale or flushed? Which I think is a fair interpretation of the text, but also, is this the most key thing ever? What matters would be that Aragorn looked more or less at least like some other men of the North, his closest kin, and they could look like anything the artist or art director wants them to, right? In an article for Newsweek, Alex Phillips described the situation by citing some pro and anti comments from various public posts, such as saying, quote, Aragorn is described in the books as of Numenorean descent, a fictitious group of people who were fair-skinned. However, in a letter, Tolkien wrote that Numenorians were best pictured in, say, Egyptian terms, though it is debated whether he meant in cultural or ethnic terms. This is a lovely piece of artwork, and while I never imagined Aragorn is black, Tolkien might have, Matt Thrower, a game writer, said, citing Tolkien's letter. One commenter is quoted as saying in the opposite direction, quote, Another responded, There's nothing wrong with a black guy in fantasy, but there is something wrong with race swaps of established and clearly defined characters, end quote. In an article for Gaming Bible, Catherine Lewis mentions the racial slurs that were forthcoming when this character design was getting an increased amount of attention. Some commentaries would suggest there's something inherently wrong with changing a character's appearance in and of itself. Why? Some series offer gender swap versions of characters, and there are clear times when a character's identity changed to accommodate a new actor, like the example Phillips gives of Sam Jackson being cast as Nick Fury in the Marvel films. No, I think this is about something other than textual fidelity alone. We'll address that argument in due time, but these online spats regularly featured appeals to the idea that this was woke or blackwashing or hypocritical because this would never be the case in reverse. That people would never tolerate a whitewashed black character, and arguments around this issue circulated on more platforms than Twitter or Facebook comment sections. You know what well and truly would not be a chariot essay experience if I didn't dig into the YouTube side of things. 
On that note, I have a number of data points to share. First, I'd like to paint you a hopefully instructively brief picture of what the usual customers are saying on this issue, with clips from videos by Ryan Kinnell of RK Outpost, Jeremy Hambly of The Quartering, and Jeremy Griggs of Geeks and Gamers. We continue to see companies across all aspects of entertainment and fandom push identity politics onto their fans. And as a result, we see that said audience push back and eventually just walk away. And Wizards of the Coast is one of those companies, the company that owns Magic the Gathering. They've been pushing for identity politics and woke nonsense and propaganda in their product for quite some time. But now they've hit a new low by bastardizing Lord of the Rings. We saw how Lord of the Rings fans pushed back against Amazon for the terrible Rings of Power series and what they did with that. But this goes even further down that road of nonsensical. He's absolutely not black, but just as we see in so many different forms of entertainment, whether it's comic books, TV, movies, everything, there is this desire to race swap characters, and shockingly, it only ever seems to go one way. Ironically, Little Mermaid is out in theaters right now as we speak. But this, this is Lord of the Rings. This is something that goes back decades and decades and decades. And Tolkien fans, Lord of the Rings fans, they care about the lore. They care about this story. And this, to a lot of people, is a slap in the face, and it's all for the purpose of identity politics. So what the, basically what the left will say to justify this and, and gaslight people into making you think that you're the bad guy is they'll say, well, it's a fictional character. It doesn't matter. There was no real Little Mermaid, so it doesn't matter that they're black now. First of all, we know that if the situations were reversed, for example, that you know, if a traditionally traditionally black character written in literature as black was portrayed by a white person, targets across the country would burn. Okay, so we know for a fact that this is absolute bollocks. Race swapping characters has uh, been the subject of controversy before. While advocates argue that such moves improve representation in popular works of fiction, critics argue that they are not true to the source material. And no, representation means nothing. Uh, no one actually cares about representation. They only care about trying to virtue signal off of it. Because we've talked about this many times. Where is all the calls for diversity in the roofing in industry or diversity in the bricklaying industry or diversity in construction diversity in the plumbing industry we need more women representation we need more people of color no one actually cares about representation they care about hijacking hijacking something that is popular and has a following that's all social justice is it's about taking advantage of someone else's hard work and then you trying to benefit from said hard work or it's about powerful people pretending that they care about these things so that they can cover up all of the bad things that they have done by making you look in another direction. That's what it's all about because no normal person actually cares about representation. Never have, never will. That's just the reality of the situation. I think those two Ryan Kinnell clips and the single The Quartering clips summarize the reaction against this adaptation rather well, and so we'll need to begin to think with reference to those positions. However, I included this Geeks and Gamers quote because when I was watching through video coverage of this issue, I found a few interesting claims being made and wanted to set aside some brief time here to address them before drilling down into what I think is the essence of the situation. Jeremy Griggs claims that nobody really cares about representation. We'll return to this idea momentarily, but in order to reason his way to this position, he also has to say that this is an attempt to hijack someone else's hard work that it's all about virtue signaling, and that nobody argues for diversity in blue-collar industries like the ones he described. All of these statements misrepresent the situation. If these paintings of Aragorn were AI art, then I could see the first one, but they appear to be the genuine hard work of real artists who got paid to do this work. Maybe they should have been paid more, but it's hardly just a bunch of people not putting the work in. I just don't get how he can seriously argue that it's all virtue signaling either, because that seems totally fantastical. Presumably, if somebody is virtue signaling insincerely, not something Geeks and Gamers is unfamiliar with as a concept, then they would be directing that behavior towards someone who is sincere in that belief. How can everybody be pandering to no one? Geeks and Gamers seems to suggest that he believes in a world where everybody agrees with him and is just pretending. For this, he offers not a shred of the monumental evidence that would be required to prove something like that, but it certainly appears copacetic with his worldview. On the point of whether or not people with these kinds of woke or just progressive politics argue for diversity in blue-collar industries like service work or manual labor, 
Geeks and Gamers is outright delusional. Not only is there a push frequently by feminists for equal treatment for women in all fields, it's downright hilarious for Jeremy to sit there and act like people should, if they want black fictional characters, also be arguing for more black representation in blue collar industries. I don't know if Geeks and Gamers is familiar with literally any of American history, but black Americans are frequently overrepresented in low paying jobs in many areas, not the other way around largely due to issues of systemic inequality. Is he seriously trying to say that he thinks most black people are earning above the median household income in the United States? That's an extraordinary claim. What's his source? Nothing? Okay. Moreover, I just find it kind of funny that Jeremy doesn't understand why someone who works for a living would want one job over another. He seems to be saying it would, hypothetically based on a perception he pulled from nowhere, be hypocritical if people wanted better representation in a nicer industry as opposed to one that's viewed as less glamorous. Although to be clear, that's an issue of his analogy and his perception as well. Black characters in a work of art aren't analogous to real black workers in a field, and the jobs Jeremy listed might not sound glamorous, but I've known people who have worked as plumbers who made surprisingly good money being competitive at that trade that required them to actually train for it and get certified. To be fair, however, everybody I know who worked as a roofer never wanted to go back to that once they got another job. That summer heat, I think, is a killer. Even so, it doesn't make a lot of sense why Jeremy would say all of that. Every roofer should be treated equally, and I can't imagine a progressive person abiding inequality there if they knew that black or female roofers were being mistreated. But also, people do tend to want better paying jobs with better working conditions, generally speaking. That is how this economy works. Is Jeremy saying we should all be communists? I assume not, but if he really believed any of this crap, the idea that a lot of this arises from how our economy is organized is on the table. Before we get too caught up in all that, I'd like to next jump to a clip from Friday Night Tights, hosted by Gary Buchler of Nerdrotic. Is he, is he standing behind his I'm wife's not boyfriend? seeing Eric. Like yeah, is this like a Where's Waldo? <laughs> behind the tree. Behind the tree. <laughs> <laughs> so who dis? Who dis? <laughs> this is uh, this is actually a form of racism because so you cannot tell me these assholes did not do this just for the reaction. This just is, this Wizards is of black, the coast. This is blackface. Just like when you way swap somebody that is a snobbish character, you are committing TV or film blackface. You're yeah. not being based. You're just blackface and characters. This is another absolutely and, and it's Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. So what to fucking expect? That company's uh -huh. lost. It's absolutely yeah, lost. It's fallen lost. to the to the cold. But I, I don't know. This, this is future landfill material. <laughs> I, I thought this was just the best person for the role. <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> oh, what? So yeah, they're like, already like dump, uh, Wizards of the Coast. They're already dumping magic cards in landfills right now. They can't get this, so they don't, yeah, and then, like then they're doing this shit. Yeah, people actually watch stuff like that. I'm just as surprised as all of you. On the subject of the many panelists, among whom were counted, of course, Nerdrotic, but also Geeks and Gamers and Shadowversity, you can probably make out the voice of Az of the channel Heel vs. Babyface, better known as the Starfield Pronouns Guy. While none of these gentlemen inspire much interest themselves, you might have perhaps caught a little bit of what he said about black-facing characters. I find the resounding agreement highly ironic given that it's followed by the usual incoherence from Shad, who can't help but undermine the point by joking about how this wasn't a casting decision. While the finer points can wait, it is in fact specifically because this is a drawing of presumably by their lights a real black person and not a white person wearing shoe polish that this causes less offense than blackface, which has a real tradition of mocking black people and also of taking casting opportunities in acting from them. Since Shad so kindly observed for us that no such opportunities have been lost, we can see this point has little merit. But there's actually something else happening here. As is doing this sort of bootleg, get woke, go broke proclamation with Wizards of the Coast here, by virtue of pointing to magic cards and landfills. By all estimations and proclamations I've seen, Wizards is as profitable as ever, doing increasing crossover events that imply they have the money to pay for other intellectual properties in their work. And despite some awkwardness attempting to monetize Dungeons & Dragons, I've never seen anyone like Mark Rosewater, for example, talk about Magic the Gathering being in a tough place. In fact, they seem to tout that the player base is continuing to grow. It's one of their favorite refrains, issues with brick-and-mortar card shops and the consequences of COVID-19 notwithstanding. However, as is gesturing at the recent phenomenon of a large number of magic cards being dumped in a landfill, seeming to imply without saying so that 
Wizards must be on hard times and thus failing to move their product. The issue with this being that it's not the only conclusion that can be drawn from this very real and documented instance of such a thing occurring. The company could just as easily have overprinted a number of cards, or have decided that waiting to move a certain amount of product to storefronts was no longer worth the cost of paying to have it stored somewhere, whereupon either they or those who owned whatever warehouse it was in simply got rid of it. There's a ton of reasons why this could have happened that are probably more likely than it having anything to do with a set that, at the time coverage of it was widely publicized, had yet to be released, so it's likely irrelevant. Finally, I'd like to look at one more of these channels that have fostered a negative social media reaction to this phenomenon. So here's two clips from the channel Endymion, with the timestamps distinguishing them noted as the Ryan Kinnell clips were earlier. This change is simply being done for one very obvious reason, which is to appeal to woke identity politics in order to seem more inclusive, and to raise their ESG score as always. And by pushing representation even when it's not needed, Wizard of the Coast are able to showcase a beloved fan character in a new light in order to gather new investors that look for higher ESG scored companies to back. Nothing that is being done here is because Wizards of the Coast as a company really cares about representation. Because if they did, they wouldn't pander by changing the race of an established character to begin with, but would instead create new characters within the mythos to strengthen and broaden the property. There's this very annoying trend where these companies use the idea of representing the real world in fantasy as a shield against criticism when the reason why people enjoy these franchises is because they're not like the real world. Again, with this PR statement from Magic, we can see that they're willing to burn bridges and lose revenue as long as they can push more representation. I think these clips are above and beyond the most fascinating drivel we've looked at so far, for so many reasons. Too many to keep to just this section of the essay without bogging it down over much. To begin, the ESG score that Endymion is talking about is of course the Corporate Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance score for considerations when responsibly investing in a corporation. This is about a lot more than diversity as representation, and in fact if I were going to reference the ESG score of Hasbro and I felt like looking at diversity, I would probably be a lot more concerned as an investor with hiring practices, but by invoking PR or public relations, I feel Endymion is interested in the social, public-facing elements of diversity at Hasbro, and Wizards of the Coast in particular. That's totally fine. What is absolutely incoherent about this series of points is how blatantly internally contradictory and egregiously unserious they are. Endymion makes the classic argument that Wizards of the Coast doesn't really care about diversity, just getting investments, which implies they really care about money. I think whether or not this person or that person at Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro generally really cares about diversity should be argued on the merits of the individual, but companies in general don't care about anything because they don't have feelings. They are, however, presumably predicated on making a profit. Endymion sets this up and then immediately reaches over to the other side of the net and spikes it in his own face by adding later in his video that the company is losing revenue and burning bridges to push this position, presumably for ideological reasons. Buddy, you just told us that they don't really care and they're just here to make money, and now you're saying they're willing to burn money because they care about the position itself? Which is it, man? This is Schrodinger's forced diversity. Companies are going woke and going broke, but they're also doing it for the money. They only care about the money and they're eschewing profit margins in favor of their ideology. These guys only care about one thing, which is money, which they would also throw away in a second to push their agenda. Cognitive dissonance is a psychological phenomenon that allows the human mind to hold two logically incompatible positions within the same worldview. In this case, the ideological motivation for doing so can be located by tracing the logic in reverse. People who believe this need it to be true in both cases, so that on the one hand they can continue to believe that a capitalist economy is something other than an injustice machine that does something other than sacrifice all merit and principle in search of profit, and that they are threatened by opponents whose political agenda is so ill-defined it need only be imagined when and where its existence would confirm what they need to be true. On the other hand, they also want to continue to believe that their ideological opponents are unprincipled, and the most conventional and obvious explanation for this would be some kind of grift, which with a corporation amounts to accusations of pandering to achieve the greatest profit incentive down the line in some form or another. That's all my interpretation of the broader dissonance, of course, but it's worth noting the little things as well. One little snag that runs in the opposite direction is that Endymion might not see the contradiction we see because he might distinguish between the real fans whose money Wizards eschews in favor of investor money. This doesn't really change the fact that they would still presumably be making bank, 
But as with a number of anti-progressive conspiracy theories about finance, there's a lingering question of who Endymion would then presumably believe is behind all of that. And I won't speculate, but I'm sure it's starting to feel like anti-woke culture war nonsense is the socialism of fools, shall we say. Another interesting detail is the fact that Endymion also appears to note Aragorn's appearance as violating some kind of immersion, which is one thing if he's making an argument that it doesn't maintain fidelity to the source material. We'll get to that later. But it's quite another in the context of his comment about this franchise not being like the real world. The implicit meaning is ostensibly that if Aragorn were white on these cards, he'd still have a magic sword and an elf wife, more on that in a moment as well, but he'd be white instead of black. Between a black Aragorn and a white Aragorn, which of these is more like the real world again? If the principle is escapism achieved by virtue of distinction from reality, wouldn't a blue Aragorn or a purple Aragorn be more different and therefore less immersion-breaking? What about a white man being white makes him specifically less real? I'm pretty sure I've seen white men before in real life, although I'm afraid I don't see the logic behind this argument, and I think I've given it and the other clips more than enough time to make the bare bones of their case. Now for a rebuttal. I wanted to spend a little time digging deeper into the issue of alleged blackwashing of established characters, because while this specific issue didn't spawn the kinds of fandom discourses that meant it got a ton of coverage from black voices on YouTube as a platform, probably a bit of a tell in itself as to how nonsensical and trite it all is, there are nevertheless a lot of videos from channels that like digging into the fandom issue of hitherto non-black characters being redrawn as black. The first that I'd like to dig into is from a great channel called Veritas Joe, who has this to say. Well, white characters are getting recasted as non-white people more and more these days. And you'd probably call a black person playing a role originally casted as a white person blackwashing as you would for these edits. What well, a difference between a black person playing a role originally a white person did and a white person playing a role originally a black person did is reasoning and erasure. No matter how many originally white roles taken by non-black people happen, they're still going to be the dominant part in representation and in real life, like they have been for, uh, for, for centuries. But if you take the role from a black person or from another person of color, you are comparatively taking what little representation we have in the first place. A good impulse I'd recommend to anyone trying to talk about these issues is that if you're a white content creator or otherwise new to the conversation for reasons of your epistemic perspective, try looking around to see if black creators have covered literally every single thing you could have possibly said on the subject, often to the tune of the most racist and deranged pushback imaginable. I watched a number of videos from black commentators and also creators in online fandom and art communities, fully intending to cite even more of them more extensively here, but genuinely, just go watch Joe's video. I'm not going to put the whole thing in here, it's just all that good. Just go watch it. I'll be here. I'll wait. I'll be here when you get back. I'm not kidding. Link in the description. Be on your best behavior. I do think I have something relatively unique, on this platform at least, to say about all of this, and I'd also like to point out that Joe's video, like the others I'll be referencing in this section, is more about black edits, black fan art, and blacktober as an event that happens every year in online art communities where black creators draw or redraw characters as black. Some of the most fire edits I've ever seen drop it around that time of year, so if it's spooky season when you're watching this, go do some quick searches for great artists to support. I promise it'll be worth your while. Back on topic, the two things Joe's video does super well are dress down the rhetoric and the intentions it frequently masks, not a thing I'm brave enough to do here, I assure you, as well as place these conversations in their relevant historical and social contexts. Yes, black edits are not the same as white or lightened edits. Yes, it is because of history and social context. Yes, this does also go for a ton of other theoretically hypocritical differences in how we talk about white people versus how we talk about black people. And yes, we will be getting into that shortly. But before we get there, here's another great video on the same subject by the non-black creator Yuki Buns, who does some cool art content herself that contains this quotation. Blackface isn't cool. It, it's not blackface though. He literally called it Blacktober. If you guys weren't aware, blackface comes from minstrel shows. This is where white actors, in plays and what have you, performed African American characters by intentionally dehumanizing and demeaning them. They would paint their faces black except for an area around their mouths trying to make their lips look comically big. They would play these characters as dumb and make a laughing stock of dark-skinned people. And this was a commonplace thing. This was normal, acceptable media at the time. This was not only, this not only was disgusting, but paved the future in a horrible way as well. Changing an anime character to black while accurately portraying a black person is not blackface. They are not making a mockery of the character. The character has been changed visually to be a person of color, but they're still maintaining the original character's personality and story. Bad take, but I hope the fella just somehow didn't know. 
I thought this video was kind of sweet, actually, and overall was a funny look at an artist responding empathetically to the exact kind of take we saw earlier on in responses to the image of Black Aragorn by Oz and the Friday Night Tights crew. I can't say I have a lot of faith that those people are just coming from a place of ignorance, but if anyone here is genuinely unfamiliar, I'd recommend Yuki Bunz's video as long as you're especially kind about it, because I don't want a bunch of deranged, discourse-demented cherry blossoms storming in and scaring all the nice little buns in the comments section. I've been placing images of just a few of the Aragorn cards from the Magic the Gathering set in question on screen here, because while this is a product made by a corporation and not the work of independent black artists and should not be treated as such, I do want to make a visual note of how this is a sincere portrayal of a black character that is not by any observation I can make meant to pillory black culture or depict black people as gross or otherwise subhuman and pitiable. It is, rather, a new and incidentally black depiction of a character who remains intriguing and inspiring in the story. As a sort of fun fact, I actually have magic decks built around a couple of these cards. If you can be the first person to guess which two in the comments, I'll pin you and give you a cookie or something. Finally, if you've seen Joe's video, I'd be remiss not to mention the creator he name drops a couple of times and whose content I binged while writing this essay. Thuman has multiple videos touching on this topic, but this one I think is one of the most concise and relevant. However, when we look at mainstream media and the animations we get from there, you will quickly realize that there is still a huge imbalance in representation. Look no further than Disney or Pixar. Out of the slew of white princess movies we have, there is only one black princess and a couple of POC princesses. Majority is still white. That's why a lot of the times we either have to just deal with it or take matters into our own hands and draw our favorite characters to look like us. Doing this doesn't hurt anyone and it's usually done to create inclusivity and even inspire black people to cosplay their favorite characters despite of their skin color. I thought this was just such a great clip because it actually takes the Little Mermaid name drop from earlier in the essay and it brings it totally full circle. Yes, it doesn't hurt anyone. Yes, it can inspire black creators and artists. Yes, it is correcting for an imbalance which has fostered an unequitable environment for black people in fandom spaces and beyond in the broader culture. Whether fans or employees of a corporation, if these artists see a red book and they want it painted black, there's really nothing wrong with that. Returning to the issue of Magic the Gathering and Black Aragorn, we can ask more specific questions about Tolkien, race, and adaptations. In a piece by John Ramos for Early Game, he asks the starter question, quote, is Aragorn black in the source material? Not really, but it's never clearly stated, and it's certainly possible. In The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien only vaguely describes Aragorn's physical appearance. A shaggy head of dark hair flecked with grey, and in a pale, stern face, a pair of keen grey eyes. But we know that Aragorn is one of the Dúnedain, and they are described in this way in the Silmarillion. And they were tall, taller than the tallest of the sons of Middle-earth, and the light of their eyes was like bright stars. But their numbers increased only slowly in the land, for their daughters and sons were born to them, fairer than their fathers, yet their children were few. Based on both descriptions, all we can deduce is that Aragorn is tall, fair, and has beautiful eyes." End quote. What's more, Ramos goes on to discuss the more relevant heart of the issue, asking, quote, Does this even matter? On the balance of probability, and given his explicit aim of making a truly English epic, Tolkien probably was imagining a white character. But ultimately, the races of men are unimportant in Lord of the Rings. The most interesting comparisons within Tolkien are always made between races, not within them. And as we know from his 1938 letter to Berlin publishing house Rutten and Loning, Tolkien found racial theories to be pernicious and unscientific. So if you respect the works and the author, don't waste your time worrying about the color of Aragorn's skin. Tolkien never did. Instead, remember Aragorn in the way the author intended, as immortalized in the appendix to The Return of the King. Then a great beauty was revealed in him, so that all who came after there looked on him in wonder. For they saw that the grace of his youth and the valor of his manhood and the wisdom and majesty of his age were blended together. And long there he lay, an image of the kings of men in glory undimmed, before the breaking of the world. Youth, valor, wisdom, and majesty." End quote. In a certain light, this is a perfectly valid read on the situation if this is really how someone feels, and I admire the open-mindedness of the perspective while analyzing the contents of the text, authorial intent, and what the story itself really seems to value in Aragorn. The character's ancestry is obviously important to him, and to Tolkien, since Aragorn is royalty, but why specifically does the conversation orbit the idea that Aragorn is white or black? It's an interesting question because Tolkien doesn't tend to use that kind of racial language despite the era in which he lived. 
The races in The Lord of the Rings as a concept are oriented around distinctions between them, for example, elves and dwarves. Kindreds of men also have distinctions drawn between them, though these tend to be less stark. That earlier exchange between Tolkien and a publisher in Nazi Germany is a much-discussed feature of this issue. In an article for Good by Todd Perry, he discusses how the Nazi takeover and institution of a great deal of censorship via art purges led to the questioning of whether Tolkien's work could be published in a German translation. The publisher in question appears to have inquired as to whether Tolkien was of Jewish descent. Here is Tolkien's reply in full. Dear Sirs, thank you for your letter. I regret that I am not clear as to what you intend by Arish. I am not of Aryan extraction, that is, Indo-Iranian. As far as I am aware, none of my ancestors spoke Hindustani, Persian, Romani, or any related dialects. But if I am to understand that you are inquiring whether I am of Jewish origin, I can only reply that I regret that I appear to have no ancestors of that gifted people. My great-great-grandfather came to England in the 18th century from Germany. The main part of my descent is therefore purely English, and I am an English subject, which should be sufficient. I have been accustomed, nonetheless, to regard my German name with pride, and continue to do so throughout the period of the late regrettable war, in which I served in the English army. I cannot, however, forbear to comment that if impertinent and irrelevant inquiries of this sort are to become the rule in matters of literature, then the time is not far distant when a German name will no longer be a source of pride. Your inquiry is doubtless made in order to comply with the laws of your own country, but that this should be held to apply to the subjects of another state would be improper, even if it had, as it has not, any bearing whatsoever on the merits of my work or its sustainability for publication of which you appear to have satisfied yourself without reference to my abstemon. I trust you will find this reply satisfactory, and remain yours faithfully, J.R.R. Tolkien. Apologies for the light editorializing for YouTube guidelines. That letter also features in a piece for Literary Hub by Walker Kaplan discussing the written exchange. It ends on another source for Tolkien's views on the Nazis, saying, quote, Three years later, Tolkien would express his disdain for the Nazis in a letter to his son Michael. I have in this war a burning private grudge against that ruddy little ignoramus Adolf Hitler, ruining, perverting, misapplying, and making forever accursed that noble northern spirit a supreme contribution to Europe which I have ever loved and tried to present in its true light." End quote. Tolkien's disdain for the Fuhrer is, of course, uncontroversial these days, but it's worth noting that all mentions of this history of distinct ethnic descents in terms of Tolkien's reference to the historical ancestry of Indo-Iranian people or his invocation of Abstamung would appear to point to Tolkien taking umbrage with the conflation of historical lineages along modern racial lines. While the egregious racial sciences of the Nazis were contemporary to Tolkien's work, they were hardly the first such European racial conflation that served political ends. Multiple centuries before Tolkien's birth, there was this thing that was pretty widespread in human history. And if you're an American watching this video, you know what I'm about to say, and if you're a Brit watching this video, you're pretending you don't. But if you're an alien digging through the digital or physical rubble of human civilization and culture, trying to get an idea of who or what we were, of what this all means, then allow me to potentially be the first to introduce you to the concept of slavery. Hey, it's me. Talking about slavery among human beings is sort of like talking about any great evil which we do unto each other. We need to believe we have to do it, because that cushions the blow of living with its consequences, and because that quiets the rumor of how little we really know about ourselves and each other running through our minds as we prepare to do it again. Slavery as a practice had weaned itself in many places by Tolkien's time, and is seen now in many of those same places as a relic of a not-too-distant, but still very much irretrievable past. We put it out of sight and out of mind, which is psychologically effectively the same thing as saying we had to do it, because that act is what that belief is trying to accomplish as a mantra for white European and colonial societies. The trick with slavery is that we're not sure how it will end, and we're not sure exactly how it started, but we do have a couple ideas. By the time of the earliest, most frequently cited human legal system, Hammurabi's Code, Slavery was already infamously treated as just a tragic, fundamental social institution. They teach us this in schools, or at least they did once in a suburban public school where the one very weird and awkward child sat in the back retaining bits and pieces while fantasizing about the Lord of the Rings. But there's a weird dissonance here. If slavery is some kind of near-eternal feature of human societies, isn't it weird that we're also implicitly taught that American or English society conquered it? It's almost as if those societies are treated as exceptional to some kind of absurd degree by the people who live within them. 
I know I'm joking with you a lot here, but the truth is that I have to, or this next part is going to hit really weird. Actually, you know what? The video only gets weirder from here. I hope you know what you signed up for. The beginning of slavery since the institution treats human beings as property to be owned can reasonably be inferred to be entangled with class society and commodities. Any place where human life relied upon the trade of things might ipso facto subject that same life to that same trade. The end of slavery, therefore, is probably tied to commodities and trade ending as well in some shape or form. However, here and now we will be concerned not with early empires building their stone structures or late empires building their steel cages, a feature that disgraces the supposed bleeding hearts and Christian love of any modern nation unwell enough to maintain them and honest enough to admit their depravity, but rather we here concern ourselves with the middle. The history recent enough to be recorded reliably, but harsh enough to be discoursed about unreliably. Prince Henry the Navigator was the son of the King of Portugal, a fact which I hope merits no citation. Portugal, along with Spain, France, and England, were infamous participants in the trade of slaves during what is sometimes called the Age of Imperialism. Prince Henry died in 1460, but his impact would ring loud and clear through the centuries in many manners indirect. Really, his death combined with the fact that one of the most memorable things about him is known to many of us who don't even know his name, together imply that the man himself, one of history's great men, might not have been especially important. Human history is funny, like that. There are actors taking exits, and sometimes, if you're looking a little too hard in one direction, it's easy to confuse one character with the show itself, even as the show goes on. I'm not a historian, but what I'm about to say is not something I imagine many historically inclined persons will feel all too interested in disputing. While I'm not attached to any etymological claim here, the phrase cut out the middleman does have an interesting geographical and philological parallel in European and Asian trade heading through the Middle East. When trading through other traders, the more of those other traders one could eliminate by securing a more direct trade route, the easier it would be to turn a profit. Portugal might have sought the African slave trade for any number of reasons at whatever level, but what is clear is that this path offered to this European nation some advantages. First, it would avoid any financial losses incurred by dealing with Islamic slavers. This had the added effect of changing which slaves the Portuguese obtained, in the sense of from which regions, cultures, and ethnicities these slaves were taken. This is why I felt it necessary to describe slavery as an institution ancient, medieval, and modern. This is a particularity we are talking about, of one kind of slavery practiced for specific historical reasons. Maybe you've noticed that in this section of the video, I've used words like ethnicity, but not race that I have described regions and continents and nations, but not people in terms of blackness or whiteness. None of these are universals. They have origins and contexts, beginnings and endings. Race is often treated as a fundamental feature of human beings, be they individuals or groups, but these modern racial categories like black people and white people have historical precedents. African chattel slavery, for example, practiced by European colonial powers, is the origin of the codification of these modern ideas. While the etymologies describing skin in terms of colors like these, or the history of describing different ethnicities in conflict with one another is much longer, and indeed the medieval history of the modern concept of race is a little more complicated, I do have some restraint and will therefore be focusing specifically on this particular idea of race. Towards the end of Prince Henry's life, King Alfonso V commissioned an author named Gomez de Zorara to write a biography about Prince Henry. In this book, published in 1453, he describes among other things the whiteness and blackness of some certain slaves at an auction, building a profile for two different kinds of people grouped together on those superficial characteristics. However, Gomez de Zarara crucially did not describe these slaves as being of a white race or a black race. This came later in other works, like those of French poet Jacques de Brise, with apologies to my French listeners, published in 1481. Gomez de Zarara's praise for white people and vilification of black people, categories in his eye superficial to his ideas about them, were later echoed in the writings of Spanish lawyer Alonso de Zuazo, in 1510 discussing the relative fitness of black African or indigenous American people to be slave laborers. By 1606, the French diplomat Jean Nicot, apologies again, would describe race in terms of descent in a French dictionary he himself authored. By 1735, the biologist Carl Linnaeus had published Systema Naturae, which among other things is the point of origin for some language with which you may be familiar about race. Linnaeus divided the human races then into four major distinct categories, white, yellow, red, and black. These are of course references to Europeans, Asians, Americans, read, natives, and Africans, but Linnaeus also codified them as Homo sapiens europaeus, 
Homo sapiens asiaticus, Homo sapiens americanus, and Homo sapiens affair, respectively, thus giving race, and therefore also racism, its thin veil of biological justification. All that and the rest is, as it goes, history. This is all to make a few points. Firstly, there is nothing confusing about the fact that some racist ideas are weirdly complementary while others are not, such as the ideas that black people are alternatively physically strong but also have a poor work ethic, if you are familiar with the origin of those ideas. In that case, the point of thinking of black people in that way was to rationalize their place in a social order, because they could then be used for slavery as much as was thought necessary by those conducting its wickedness, and in fact those conducting it came to see their wickedness narcissistically as altruism, deciding that since slavery was the way of things, and since whiteness and blackness too had come to be the way of things, white people and black people must surely belong in the places they inhabit. And so the black slave laborer needed to work and the white overseer or master needed to be there to direct them. In reality, this is no more than an ideological reinterpretation of reality, a kind of sour grapes except constructed to cope with the enrichment of white-dominated European and colonial social orders. Because of the fundamentally pseudoscientific and deeply unserious character of the assertions that codified race as a concept, race is as useful for talking about human beings as racism, which is to say that descriptively it does say something about how we treat each other, but it isn't real in the way many of us seem to want it to be. Making it real in the way the sun or sea is real certainly allows us to think differently about the world, but believing this would not make it so. Funnily enough, when I was younger, I actually wondered to myself why Tolkien didn't just call some people white and others black. He certainly used those words for colors or pigment or light often enough, and he even deployed these ideas for descriptions of mood and passion, so why not race? Why not descent? Much has been made of Tolkien's aversion to allegory, but I actually think the earlier quotation about spurious and unscientific racial theories and abstemung is more insightful in this case. Tolkien was, despite what appears to be his reputation, very considerate in what he did and did not replicate. I highly doubt that 20th century Catholics of any stripe, based on my intimate experience with them being raised Catholic in America, could seriously be said to be coming from an intentionally politically progressive place. Time, however, makes fools of us all, and for the artist this has the possibility of being true in strange and beautiful ways. While I was working on bringing the later stages of this essay to completion, a totally coincidental video by the YouTube channel Verily Bitchy appeared in my feed, largely covering Tolkien and gender. The part of that video essay that I buy, above all else, is that Tolkien would proactively seek inspiration from fairy tales and mythology, as now appears to be the case with Eowyn's subplot. Tolkien was dedicated to what he did, and I think regardless of whether he would approve or not, the fact that so many queer people see reflections of themselves in his work is evidence of that. With one or two exceptions, Tolkien doesn't tend to describe races as simply white or black, not because he had a love for purple prose, but because he was trying to construct a setting that felt like it had its own real history behind it, and he built that history with reference to linguistics and mythology and geography. I loved The Silmarillion as a child because it felt like equal parts travel guide, history book, and narrative mythology of a world I already deeply loved. I think daily about the Doom of Mandos, about Fingon begging Manwe for mercy as he prepares to kill his friend, about Fingolfin challenging Morgoth to single combat, about Baron first glimpsing Luthien Tenuviel, about Finrod Felagund engaging in a battle of song and sorcery with Sauron, about the battle of unnumbered tears with Turgon's arrival and Fingon's death and Hurin's last stand, about Turin Turambar slaying the dragon Glaurung and throwing himself on his black sword, and about the fall of Gondolin. The setting, to say the least, compels, and for so many reasons. Aragorn isn't really white. He isn't really black either. And he isn't entirely what you want him to be. He's one of the Dúnedain of the line of kings descended from Númenor. That race doesn't really exist, so when we debate Aragorn's race, what we're really doing is confusing being white or black with looking a certain way, which is itself doing the rhetorical work of racists from centuries ago who started all of this discourse with the same conflation. I don't think it matters all that much whether a black or white actor plays Aragorn, and I don't think it matters all that much whether he's painted with dark or light skin either. It's not just that there's no harm here, there's also no direct allegory for race relations in Middle-earth. The second you try to do that, you notice all the willing divergences Tolkien makes. His story is written from a Western European and particularly an English point of view, but if that's the case then the closest allegory of Numenorians to a medieval British person would have to be the Romans. And that's not exactly a one-to-one comparison either, so why bother trying to capture such things in a way that reduces them? 
You can make those observations, but you shouldn't hold to them too tightly. Modern racial ideas don't fit neatly into Middle-earth's fantastical ones, and that's fine. In fact, I think it's beautiful. I'd next like to steer this discussion in the direction of questioning how we imagine race and what the implications of that might be. The further we go into this video, the more I feel we veer from topic to topic in a way that might feel unclear before the end, but I'm hoping to tie together these increasingly esoteric tangents into something that actually makes sense. As part of my research for this video, I consulted a text by Alex Zamelin called Black Utopia, the History of an Idea from Black Nationalism to Afrofuturism. I like reading texts like this just to educate myself on this topic, but things fell into place the right way at the right time such that I had a few books on hand that felt like they actually explained some seemingly unrelated things in a unified way. Samalin remarks that, quote, Black Utopia was never a transhistorical idea. This is because its meaning had everything to do with the existing social conditions of a given moment, but its specific concern was always with the Black diaspora. By taking up ideal solutions to the specific problems of slavery, colonialism, Jim Crow, lynching, mass incarceration, deregulation, and war, Black Utopia was in conversation with prevailing political realities, crises, and cultural trends. Black reflections on Utopia emerged from the Afro-modern experience, which was defined by the experience of enslavement, global empire, and the formative role of Enlightenment idealism and its radical offshoots. This experience is what critic Paul Gilroy has called the double consciousness of the Black Atlantic. This is why Black Utopian images range from Black emigration and interracial solidarity to post-racialism, pan-Africanism, and interplanetary escape into the cosmos. But each reiteration retained shared visions. Black Utopians rehashed elements of platonic idealism about total social transformation, while anti-Utopians were more critical about its prospects. But utopians were often more self-consciously aware than anti-utopians, whose romantic critiques embodied the utopianism they denounced." End quote. I want to make a couple things clear about this quotation. I have almost exclusively encountered notions of utopianism in my life as denunciations of the impossible. Zamelin describes this as a kind of criticism or cynicism, but I really think to dig into that perspective yields a deeper kind of ideological bias more akin to blinders. What is or is not possible in terms of social progress as dictated by the horizons of what the current social systems and their ideologies create or promote is itself the line between utopia and anti-utopia in discourse. Therefore, cynicism about Afrofuturism should be tempered with the knowledge that our social system and its justifying ideology tautologically creates the boundaries of what is or is not possible with reference to its subjectivity. The role of the radical, I think, is to imagine beyond the boundaries of what can be seen or known. So questions of the possible or impossible become weighed down with ideological restrictions that are to be discarded and negated first. I quote this passage specifically because it first affirms the earlier perspectives about the historical subjectivity of black thought as it imagined itself into the future or elsewhere, and because it makes clear the connection between this kind of utopianism, still not my favorite word for this, and romanticism. I would, when being charitable to this idea, christen it Afro-romanticism, and describe it in charitable terms as the desire to place black people as the equals of white people, or on their own terms, in the romantic movement as it responds to very real historical subjectivities of its own. I believe this creative act can just as easily be justified on the face of it as an Afrofuturist text could be, with some caveats. I also think that, because The Lord of the Rings is a highly romantic text, a black Aragorn is essentially Afro-romantic and seemingly and seemingly in all the defensible ways, because Middle-earth does not share that historical subjectivity of our world as a one-to-one -one comparison. Tolkien was certainly clear about that, and it shines through. This also brings us back to bear on the Gollum game, because while I was willing to question the decision to make a game about Smeagol and slavery, I think the overall impulse is exactly sound for the reasons I've observed here. Tolkien's work was romantic, he has certain elements of social commentary well developed within it. And it must be stated that making a Lord of the Rings video game that deals with slavery and industry is nonetheless thematically consistent. The Gollum game is valid in its premise for the same reason that any other romantic take on Tolkien's work could be valid, horrendous bugs and myriad other issues notwithstanding. There are also some problems with the union of blackness and romanticism that I think are worth noting, but we have to get our hands dirty for a second in order to get there. As an aside, I have noticed among some casual Afro-pessimist accounts of the history of anti-blackness and the history of racism, which appear to engage in a kind of what I would passingly term racial presentism. You might also be familiar with some more sinister versions of this way of thinking, like the discourses some months back which decried Anne Frank as a white Becky, 
or talked about how she must have had some kind of white privilege, otherwise she would be targeted by the Nazis on sight. I have even seen one or two prominent black writers over the years claim that black people were the primary targets of the Holocaust, as opposed to Jews or any other nationalities or ethnicities in Eastern Europe, which were also targeted to a great extent. Many of these views, you might think, are, even if we are being charitable to the grains of truth contained within them, that for example the Nazis did not have a positive view of black people, or that Anne Frank does have a pale skin tone in all known photographs of her, are despite this, otherwise unserious and frankly disturbed points of view that border on the anti-Semitic. They are also not necessarily representative of all of Afro-pessimism, and certainly are not representative of the other movements we've discussed thus far. They're also just wrong, and suggest something foul about the people so dedicated to pushing them. Obviously, the anti-Semitism and statistical death toll for Jews in the Holocaust is insanely well documented, obviously being some kind of vaguely white passing, in an American context anyway, didn't save Anne Frank in the historical Nazi Germany because she and her family very much did have to hide from the Nazis, and she very much was murdered by them in a real concentration camp. To say nothing of the moral implications of dragging the name and face of a child victim of the Holocaust through the mud for Twitter likes. I have to stress that these are the fringe opinions of a small handful of detestable individuals, despite the fact that I have seen them reach certain levels of critical prominence in online spaces. So, why bring them up? Well, the error that the more odious reactionaries I first quoted in this video make, which many of the brighter content creators I quoted immediately after get right, is a distinction of context. Presentism, in general, is the projection of present conditions onto the past, the assumption that because it is now, so too it must always have been. This is genuinely one of the most consistent features of conservative American commentaries on racial issues that I think I see in here of all time. And so this section of this essay on blackness and imagination is essentially a warning to the consequences of our own projections. Knowingly projecting blackness onto the past as a romantic fantasy, or the future as science fiction, is more than acceptable. It does in fact constitute the worthwhile task of defying the erasure of black people by a white racial order. However, I do think there's a need here to recognize the difference between looking a certain way, having a certain ethnic background, and being of a certain race. Our notions of race have historical precedence. There is, therefore, a political implication to projecting a historical idea onto a part of history to which it did not belong, as well as projecting it onto a future in which its continued existence has political ramifications. When we imagine black people in the future, this is frequently a component thought to imagining white people in the future, to attempting to push back against white-dominated racial erasure in media. This is good and necessary. But we should not confuse the appearance of the thing with the thing itself, nor its qualities and context. The racial presentism I mentioned occurs sometimes in more well-meaning and nuanced situations, like when a historical figure with the title The Black is interpreted as being racially black in the modern sense, or when descriptions of Africans with dark skin as having a black complexion or other such similar is conflated with colonial ideas of race that codified blackness as we know it. These kinds of assertions blur the lines between metaphorical uses of color, literal descriptions of color, and color euphemisms for race itself. To see race, to really see it, is to look beyond these confusions of language and the visible and see instead a history. This is why I said earlier that, in a sense, Aragorn really isn't black or white. Tolkien was a romanticist, but he was also a fantasy author, and in a fantasy context, the history is different, so what we would categorize as black or white metatextually is, in the world of Middle-earth, something else entirely. And that is where our creative spirit may fulfill its role, I think. Afro-romanticism without racial presentism has the ability to dream of such worlds. This is the power of black fantasy. Okay, so, assuming you're back from watching that very cool and much better Verily Bitchy video about queerness in The Lord of the Rings, you'll probably be ready for the next level of this descent into insanity. It will not go unremarked upon in this discussion by eagle-eyed audience members that any inquest into the spark of this online meltdown about Aragorn's race yields a specific image of the Magic the Gathering card picturing Aragorn and Arwen at their wedding. I think this is a really cute piece of artwork because, for Tolkien, interracial relationships are matters of special significance. They appear rarely in his work relative to other unions, especially considering the many relationships implied to have taken place in Middle-earth genealogies but tend to represent positive relations between kingdoms like Faramir and Eowyn bringing Gondor and Rohan closer together, or some kind of forbidden love defying all odds and all norms like Baron and Luthien. 
Neither of those descriptions do justice to those relationships, which have deeper and more provocative contexts in the books, but the point is that there are different kinds of interracial relationships, and they have different, usually positive, contexts. Some of you probably cringed when I said Faramir and Eowyn were an interracial relationship, but the funny thing is that, in the sense that race can be applied in Tolkien's work in a medieval sense, they kind of are. They descend from different lineages, come from different kingdoms, and represent different cultures. That's basically being from two races, at least interpretively. But Tolkien is most explicit about the idea of different races existing in Middle-earth when he writes about the word in the sense of fantasy races like men, elves, dwarves, hobbits, and so on. In this sense, interracial relations are increasingly rare, so they are also increasingly special for the narrative. I know some people quibble about the presentation of certain narrative elements from the books developing a different context for the film narrative, and I have been such a quibbler. I love a good quibbler, Harry Potter fans I see you, but these changes while different are not entirely awful. In The Fellowship of the Ring, Jackson making Arwen rescue Frodo to the point she effectively gives him her immortality, and thus her place in Valinor, is a sweet change because it paints her in a more active light and gives her later decision in the next two films more emotional context. In The Two Towers, Arwen spends so much time in this kind of romantic, sexual, spiritual contact with Aragorn that the films effectively make Aragorn even more narratively prominent than the books did, a fact continued with The Return of the King, where Arwen's life becomes tied to the One Ring. I have never been as happy for a fictional heterosexual couple as when Arwen goes to bow to Aragorn and he tenderly raises her chin. Truly he is the final boss of Wife Guys. For Tolkien, it was not just the relationship that was special, but also those pieces which a Catholic might believe would consummate that relationship, evidenced by the man himself saying, quote, "...the act of procreation, being of a will and desire shared and indeed controlled by the Fea, soul, was achieved at the speed of other conscious and willful acts of delight or of making. It was one of the acts of chief delight, in process and in memory in an elvish life, but its intensity alone provided its importance, not its time or length." It could not have been endured for a great length of time without disastrous expense. It is longer and of more intense delight in elves than in men. Too intense to be long endured." End quote. So we know Luthien destroyed Baron. That elf pussy has men coming back from the halls of Mandos, marching into Morgoth's halls, talking smack to Sauron. In short, acting unwise. In a conversation in my Discord, which you can join at a link in the description, I tried to explain my thoughts on relationships in Tolkien, which in effect only contributed to the breakdown I had trying to write this video, so I'll just quote that here. Sometimes people bring up Arwen technically being like, Aragorn's cousin many times removed, and like, buddy, way worse than that happens in the Silmarillion. Turin literally fucks his actual sister because the first ever dragon did hypnosis and then they kill themselves. Also, lesser discussed, but the brother of Hurin, man, is Hur, man, and he is owed a debt by King Turgon, elf, and therefore Turgon fosters his son Tuor, man, who knocks up Turgon's daughter Idril, elf, which apparently Turgon the High King and last great leader of the elves is just totally chill about, and they survive the fall of Gondolin, where Gandalf and Bilbo and Thorin's swords are from, and bang, before Tuor just goes, yeah, I'm beat, I'm gonna go be immortal now, and is literally the only man to ever get into elf heaven because he's just that much of a wife guy in his interracial marriage, me too buddy, which is insane by the way, because when Baron wanted to bang Luthien, her dad Thingol was all like, answer me my riddles three, and Baron lost a hand and literally died and got tortured, and his friends died, and Huar was like, hey, can I live here, whereupon Turgon was very seriously like, yes, but only if you fuck my daughter, like really fuck her, like just really give it to her, like I'm talking put her in a wheelchair with triplets type shit. And then their child, Arendil, half-elven, marries Elwing, half-elven, who is the daughter of Dior, half-elven, who is the son of Baron, Man, and Luthien, elf, of whom Arwen, elf, is a reincarnation, ostensibly, metaphorically, and Arendil and Elwing swing the tide of the war and become the only Silmaril above ground, inheriting it from Dior, and become the light in Frodo's Starglass. Arendil and Elwing have two sons, Elrond and Elros, who get to choose their race, Respec, and choose Elf and Man and foster the line, creating Arwen and Aragorn respectively. So basically, there are three known interracial couples in The Lord of the Rings. And from them, like, 90% of the good in the series achieved by mortals is possible. Tolkien says, get your swirl on, because Super God needs warriors for the Goblin Wars. To you, Ringbearer, I give the light of interracial incest. May it make you as wet as it makes me. What? What? Are you related to these people, Galadriel? Are they related to each other? 
Yes, Frodo, you don't have to remind me, that's what the light was for. R.I.P. Sir Tolkien, you would have loved the Futanari no Elf Dojinshi. Okay, no, he wouldn't have, right? At least he might not have. I don't know. I don't know why I say these stupid things. To call interracial relations between men and elves in Tolkien's work complicated would be an understatement. I should point out that there's a lot of tragedy and tenderness that accompanies each beat of every story I just skated over. They're soulful, provocative, loving in a way that J.R.R. Tolkien's and Christopher Tolkien's prose brings to life. I've joked and poked fun, but in the midst of all that, I think it's worth remembering that Tolkien took his world of Middle-earth seriously. With that in mind, I think the beauty of human-elf relationships in his stories inspires something in the mind about high beauty existing beyond the boundaries of race. It's not just that when differences are cultural and superficial we should still see ourselves in each other, but also that when we are truly different, even person to person, there's beauty and love in that too. Maybe in the way that real-life interracial relationships are subject to a great deal of fixation on the one hand and revulsion on the other, taking the racist idea and making it real while also overcoming it grants potential for a kind of sincere translation of something that is the source of a great deal of pain and prejudice into something that can be the source of an admirable human love. It is once again, I think, the fantasy genre that allows for this creative liberty. Fantasy can fantastically lampoon the idea of race as we know it, or alternatively use sincerity to transform it. This way of thinking also has implications for how we read Tolkien. Is it constructive to think of Tolkien as having reimagined race, or has he reasserted it in a way that has a troubled context? There is opportunity for a depth of discourse here that isn't always being capitalized upon in the most judicious manner, inane rants about banging elf women notwithstanding. It especially isn't going to be captured by certain uh, subsets of Tolkien fans who start talking like Vegeta every time they see an interracial couple, like, Grow up! Ruled by another! Watch your race dwindle to a handful! And tell me what has more meaning than your own strength! Alright, buddy boy, I'm gonna need you to close those Pornhub tabs, put both hands above the table, and repeat after me. I will not be weird about race mixing. And I will go to therapy. Okay? Alright, good. Stop going on some of those forums, and you'll be well on your way to maybe finding real meaning in a genuine relationship. Fantasy takes race as a human concept and makes it real as a species concept, seeing kindreds as almost different types of being entirely, the way racists tried to pretend humans could be. In thinking through that notion seriously, we can develop a better sense of what it has really come to mean to us, sincerely or playfully. In a sense, fantasy has the ability to make something ugly about our history beautiful in a fantastical setting. Again, the history of our world is not a fantasy, it is reality. But how we choose to engage with fantasy can say something about ourselves, even if the point of reference for the fantasy is itself superficially something we would rather not think about. Fantasy can make race silly, funny, beautiful, noble, or just plain weird. It takes the real emotions that real humans have, really felt in our real history, and makes them something we can engage with discursively, as ideas, in a realm where we are finally the authors of human fates. What we do with those fates, or why, might be what truly counts. I think, having run down a few of the racial implications of this discourse about Aragorn from the Tales of Middle-earth trading card set, we can return to the notions of adaptations and how to understand them. It's time once again to talk about Amazon's series The Rings of Power. I've spoken about this series a little bit before, and overall I think it's decent, but probably has its best days ahead of it. On the one hand, I think a lot of the actors did a good job. A couple of them like Lloyd Owen as Elendil and Lenny Henry as Sadok really stood out to me as selling their characters very hard, with my absolute favorite being best boy Joseph Maul giving a great performance as Adar, and I liked the sets and the creative license that the show had going for it. I would like to remark that I think editorializing Fingon's death as occurring in the Last Battle of the First Age, as opposed to his death in the Dungeons of Sauron protecting Baron originally in the Lay of Lathian, wasn't my favorite choice, and the lighting and costuming made some of the scenes feel a little cheesier than others, with that big battle at the end of the season feeling a little understaffed, very small armies getting into a very petty squabble. But overall, I think the show's strengths give it a lot of potential. I've heard Joseph Maul is leaving the show, and they're bringing on some casting changes, which I think is a shame, but there's still so many strong actors that are going to be on the next season that I'm looking forward to it. 
A number of channels have remarked upon this show in a very negative light on this platform, but the ones I tend to trust are the ones who don't churn out predictable anti-woke garbage, and who make salient and incisive commentaries on the things they cover. One such channel is Jess of the Shire, who had this to say about the Rings of Power as an adaptation. If every story is essentially inspired by the ones that came before it, where do we draw the line on what an adaptation is? Is A Wizard of Earthsea, or Harry Potter, or A Game of Thrones, or Star Wars an adaptation of The Lord of the Rings? Most people would say no. They would call them an offshoot, or an expansion, or a different take, and they would be lauded for the ways in which they differ from the original inspirational material. Now, this does get more complex. When you have a story that's cited as being directly based on Tolkien, but I don't think it removes it entirely from this conversation. The dictionary definition of adapt is to make something suitable for a new purpose. Change is inevitable and unavoidable. So if this change is so inevitable and unavoidable, then why does the entire internet blow its top off when they give Elrond a buzz cut? And I totally understand appreciating the source material and wishing that its integrity could be maintained in a new format. But I also think that we have to understand that being inspired by Tolkien does not mean that we have to be shackled to every particular detail of the original work. Jess is drawing on Tolkien's essay on fairy stories for this video, and I think her perspective comes across as a sincere attempt to, out of love for Tolkien's writing, say something new that needed to be said about adaptations. I was totally picking up what she was putting down, which is why I'd like to now tie this conversation together with a little of what we covered earlier. In A Theory of Adaptation, Linda Hutchian writes about a very similar idea and how it plays into how we see work adapted, saying, quote, Adaptations are so much a part of Western culture that they seem to affirm Walter Benjamin's insight that storytelling is always the art of repeating stories. Art is derived from other art. Stories are born of other stories, end quote. Tolkien, a master of romantic fantasy and fairy tales with a deep education in the English language and medievalism, knew it. Walter Benjamin, himself something of a romanticist critic who drew on ideas from sources such as Marxism and Judaism, knew it. Linda Hutchian, a contemporary academic who has authored compelling discourses on art arising from ideas of intertextuality and postmodernism, seems to know it too. When Hutchian describes the task before her in approaching the issue of understanding adaptations, she lays out a few weaknesses of alternative approaches like using case studies, and she tellingly says, quote, It has tended to privilege, or at least give priority to, and therefore implicitly value, to what is always called the source text or the original. As I examine in the first chapter, the idea of fidelity to that prior text is often what drives that comparative method of study, end quote. What Hutchin is laying her finger on here is that it is conspicuous that fidelity to an original source is considered the bar by which so many metrics judge the adaptation, rather than choosing to judge the adaptation on its own terms. If we attempt to disentangle this way of thinking, we begin to see that to judge an adaptation as a work of art does also require us to see it primarily as a text itself, as intertextual as any other, especially given its form, but ultimately as a particular work. If we do not do this, we may fail to see the substance of the work and instead disregard that which has merit on what is ultimately a definitively arbitrary standard that curbs the creativity of the artist. At this junction, the art can at best only be reproduced perfectly, which is to say that it can only be reprinted, if it were a series of books. True to her analysis, Hutchin calls such a perfect adaptation a theoretical ideal, but a practical impossibility in even the simplest forms, such as translating a text. Hutchin describes adaptation as having certain key qualities, saying, quote, In short, adaptation can be described as the following. 1. An acknowledged transposition of a recognizable other work or works. 2. A creative and an interpretive act of appropriation slash salvaging. 3. An extended intertextual engagement with the adapted work, end quote. She goes on to remark on the norms of critiques of adaptations that, quote, most theories of adaptation assume, however, that the story is the common denominator, the core of what is transposed across different media and genres, each of which deals with that story in formally different ways, and, I would add, through different modes of engagement, narrating, performing, or interacting. In adapting, the story argument goes, equivalences are sought in different sign systems for the various elements of the story, its themes, events, world, characters, motivations, points of view, consequences, contexts, symbols, imagery, and so on. 
As Millicent Marcus has explained, however, there are two opposing theoretical schools of thought on this point. Either a story can exist independently of any embodiment in any particular signifying system, or, on the contrary, it cannot be considered separately from its material mode of mediation. What the phenomenon of adaptation suggests, however, is that although the latter is obviously true for the audience, whose members experience the story in a particular form, the various elements of the story can be and are considered separately by adapters and by theorists, if only because technical constraints of different media will inevitably highlight different aspects of that story." End quote. This really comes back to a huge element of this conversation in these online social media spaces that has shaped ways of thinking to an immense degree. Because most viewers, and indeed many critics themselves, are not experts in the creation of many of the forms of media they create, in fact almost none have expertise in all, they are therefore reliant upon certain methods of approach. For the autodidact, the tried and true method is sourcing secondary literature. This is frequently also the refrain of the former academics among creators. Being able to speak with casual expertise frequently means confident and mainly unsourced presentation of one's own practice. So why, then, are so many critics on these platforms so fixated on writing? Think about it. They aren't all or even mostly successful writers, and they aren't all or even mostly educated in these arts, specifically the liberal arts study of literature or creative writing. So why writing? Almost every refrain seems to amount to speculation on how a film, comic, television series, or video game was written. I would mention books, but these seem frequently neglected with some exceptions, mainly lore channels and book reviewers specifically. Many who speak broadly about geek and fandom culture, who also incidentally seem to churn out so much of this hostile reception to properties like the ones we've seen discussed in this essay and in others I've posted here, for your viewing pleasure of course, again and again seem to be the very same ones who fixate on writing almost solely. A lack of sources would presumably indicate personal expertise. So why? Why writing? Why is it always, this character was badly written, or this scene was written like this or that, and so on? The emptiness and repetitiveness of these arguments is suspicious. This observation for me exists in parallel to Hutchin's observation about the near universality of the story argument. Hutchin very readily notes the economic context of adaptations, what we often call tie-ins and the like. But as with her earlier dictum on stories existing both in separation from and in relation to other texts, this highlights a certain inevitability of her argument. Recreation and reinterpretation are, for the adaptation, one and the same. We must remember Nietzsche's aphorism, if a temple is to be erected, a temple must be destroyed. All creative acts are destructive acts, and vice versa, and thusly all creation is recreation. All tongues of flame are the sons of wood and the mothers of ash. I take comfort in that. I abide by that. Where some see only one side or the other, I believe in viewing both elements of the exchange with parody. Adaptation is the Tao of the culture machine. It is at once both reproduction in industry and recreation in personal expression. We will explore this in a future video going further into Walter Benjamin's views on the topic, but this will have to do for theoretical groundings for now. I will always ask one thing of the creators of an adaptation regardless of their context. They must attempt to say something. They must have their own voice. They must be creative beings. That is all to say nothing more or less than that they are themselves artists engaged in the human and personal act of creating art. This new thing connected to this old thing, like all things are, can't be what came before. And attempting to make it so is nothing short of a prelapsarian delusion, an attempt to, at the ripe old age of 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, get on one's hands and knees and crawl with weeping impotent rage all the way back into the womb. Should we be so foolish, the world and everything in it is prepared to defy us. Remember that Endymion clip from way earlier? One of the things he said that I deliberately buried until this point in the video was that Wizards of the Coast couldn't possibly care about representation of minority identities, because if they did, they would be making original characters with those identities. I know any real Magic players out there were probably tempted to stop and write their own comment the second they heard that. It's such an astonishingly dishonest portrayal of the situation, and so obviously incorrect to anyone who knows what they're talking about, that it exposes how disinterested a lot of these anti-woke creators are in the properties and products they allegedly love so much. Wizards of the Coast has, with Magic the Gathering as a property, created one of the most massive and diverse casts of characters that I have ever seen. Could they do more? Of course, there's always opportunities to be taken. 
But this game has transgender female warriors, non-binary wizards, black naiads, and entire sets full of characters of different races. You can't tell your audience with a straight face that Wizards of the Coast isn't making an effort to create original characters with diverse identities and improving representation in the process. I guess by Endymion's logic, going off what he said, the teams creating Magic the Gathering sets in their art direction must care, or at least somebody on the team must care in some genuine capacity about representation. I think his logic was always silly, but the opposite of what he implied is the case, so who knows? What's even more interesting is that he deliberately used footage from the video game Middle Earth Shadow of War while also being a part of this tidal wave of goofy content creators slamming this ostensible lore break of an Aragorn with dark skin. I totally get that Tolkien was probably thinking of a lighter skinned Aragorn when he wrote The Lord of the Rings, but I'm not convinced this is worth getting that upset about any more than Shadow of War having Isildur and Helm be ringwraiths, or having the Eye of Sauron during the timeline of the Lord of the Rings books be half Celebrimbor's spirit, or any number of other things like the ringwraiths riding fire-breathing drakes, or there being a Balrog in Mordor, you get the idea. Why not also be mad about two of the ringwraiths being Asian women if you're so bent out of shape about the idea of a black Aragorn? They made Shelob a sexy woman! I guess the developers of this game must also really care about diversity and representation because they made original characters black or female, and some of them have important plot roles, or entire DLCs where you play as them, or skins you can use in the main game. I could go on with the various elements, large and small, that probably aren't what Tolkien really envisioned for his world or what a lot of us fell in love with to begin with, but you get my point. For the record, I like Sexy Woman Shelob. I think it makes her character relevant to the plot of the game in an interesting way, and she's totally my type, so I'm all about it. I'm honestly more disappointed we never got a Sexy Shelob skin. We got three Eltariel skins, but no Sauron or Shelob or Idril. I don't know, it seems like a missed opportunity. But despite everything, longtime viewers and friends will know that the Middle-Earth Shadow series is one of my favorite game series of all time, next to War in the North. They're actually my favorite Tolkien video game adaptations among a slew of great games. I long for a third game in this series. I think they're great, and a part of that greatness is where they chose to hold to Tolkien's ideas and where they chose to deviate. It's one thing to remark that there will always be deviation in adaptation. For example, the story beats of a book series operate on fundamentally different principles from the poetics of television, film, or video games. But it is quite another thing entirely to understand that there is value in deviation, because it enables the voice of the artists with whom we are engaging in the here and now. If I want to read The Lord of the Rings, I will go and read The Lord of the Rings, and I regularly do. I believe firmly in my heart that they are one of the greatest series of books that have ever been written. However, when I sit down to play a game or watch a film or show, I am signing up for something different. I think the impulse to judge works by something that they inherently are not, but rather to which they have an intimate relationship, purely in terms of realizing the thing itself with total fidelity means you will always experience some degree of disappointment. I remember online forums after Peter Jackson's films came out being absolutely clogged with people who felt firmly comfortable ripping his work to shreds because of all the things he changed, whether it was Faramir, Gimli, Denethor, Arwen, or any other element. Now if you ask around, those movies are sacrosanct, and now something similar is happening with a lot of these games that are starting to age by a couple years. People are even relatively nostalgic for Jackson's Hobbit films now, a fact with which I am well familiar having made a lukewarm defense of those films years ago that inspired comments tearing into my video for not being defensive enough. What will people be saying was better than whatever we're currently getting in another 5 years? Another 10? Another 15? Another 20? What is clear to me is how unserious and ignorant a lot of this sniping is. It's not just that people are ironically condemning representation or diversity as an agenda while pushing their own political messaging, it's so much more than that. The same arguments are furthered over and over, the same mistakes are made over and over, and nobody seems to be learning from any of it. They just fall into cycles of anger, condescension, and wild insinuation. This has been happening way longer than most people realize, even specifically to black artists and with black fictional characters in contemporary media properties online. I always think of the late great Dwayne McDuffie's words on the matter, specifically when he discussed his tenure writing for the now almost universally beloved Justice League Unlimited series. Well, I think, uh, I, I think being a writer that the reader knows is black puts a lot of the 
well, mainstream, I say mainstream, I mean white readership on edge. I mean white male readership on edge. They're really looking for some proof that I'm trying to, the phrase I get all the time is I'm always trying to shove my agenda down their throat, which, which seems sexually charged to me. I don't know. But uh, I came on the Justice League after a very successful uh, run. And during that run, they had added two black members to the team. And it was already planned that two more black members would join the team very shortly. So when I came on the book, I was told right up front, bring the uh, black Green Lantern in and bring in uh, Firestorm, who's a kind of a young Spider-Manish superhero who's a, a black college kid. And I'm like, oh, great, okay. And before I knew it, I had broken what I call the rule of three. And that rule is, in popular entertainment, if there are three black people in it, it is a black product. Uh, you know, you can have two black guys, although it's a stretch. If you have three, it's a black show. And suddenly, it was a black show. And somebody, I think the artist did a pinup with all the black characters, and somebody uh, leaked it and said, that's the cover. McDuffie's going to turn the Justice League all black. He's getting rid of the white guys. You know, never a plan, never even considered, but it, it freaked people out, so they're reading the stuff looking for proof. A couple of things leap out to me all over again going back and watching these interview clips from all these years ago. This was uploaded to YouTube in 2010, remember, but the comments feel so current. A lot of the rhetoric and behaviors McDuffie talks about are still being engaged in today, but something else that also jumped out to me after reading Hutchins' book was that Duane had noticed something she quotes Robert Stamm in observing about the ways people talk about adaptation. Ideas of infidelity, betrayal, deformation, violation, vulgarization, or desecration themselves speak to a kind of prudishness, perfidy, aesthetic disgust, sexual violence, degradation, or religious sacrilege. These are, in other words, the notions of another kind of mode of thought altogether, not the totally clear-sighted objective analysis or even-handed commentary without agenda that some people might claim, but an ideological bias rooted in certain cultural norms. There is, essentially, a conservative political reaction at play in this very way of thinking and speaking about art, and it takes the form of a social reaction. This is not merely because of the particulars of any commentary on the racial components of the issue. As is so often decried, they will call you racist for just not liking it, which is in this case irrelevant because it is not the broad stance or abstract position that is in question, but its particulars and application. But additionally, because of the entire frame of reference that has made fear responses to black representation bedfellows with monetized, politicized propaganda over art. These new reactionaries have, whether purely for revenue or because they truly never understood why it was that conservatives of a previous generation themselves became reactionary, turned back to a commonplace mode of thought that they have inherited from this society. It ultimately is not rational to see a black guy and immediately flip out about whatever agenda or invisible hand guiding cultural forces put him in front of your eyes. That's actually pretty psychotic. I would never suggest anyone needs to like or endorse any work of art or product, but if the arguments are staying the same while the positions they justify are slowly changing over time, that's a sign that you're not steering your own opinions. And that is the broad cultural shift I have observed in many ways. Many individuals insist they feel so staunchly that this or that can't be good on such and such logical basis, and overall the winds are shifting. I actually think that this is a pretty big flaw of social conservatism itself. You may imagine yourself an unmoving continent amid an ocean of inadequacies, but as the earth moves, you move. You are not so rational. You are not so attached to objectivity. So many of these arguments are made without a great deal of effort to experience these subjects from a theoretical point of view, and much of what passes for commentary is hackery and charlatanry. And that makes the vitriol that much more unjust. It is, I think, the critics' betrayal of their values, their culture, and those artists who labored to give the critic anything worthwhile to do to begin with. Since we're not related, it'll be okay. All right, everybody, that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, if nothing else, I think it should prove that I'm not as crazy as you think I am. I'm, uh, I'm actually way worse. If you'd like to enable my discovery of a 
esoteric kind of mental illness that they only give English majors, you know, you can always support me on Patreon or just subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment on the video, share the video, tell the video how you feel, you know, all that great stuff. Uh, and I just want to say I'm really thankful for you all. I'm really thankful for the support. I'm really thankful for how vocal you guys are about how much you care about the stuff I make. And, uh, you know, I've been trying to step up the video quality in terms of the research and the commentary. And I'm still improving. I'm still, you know, digging into things. But, uh, I, you know, I just really hope that you guys are getting out of this, what I'm putting into it. And with that said, thanks for watching. Thanks so much. I hope you have a really pleasant day, you know. Be well. Take care of yourselves. None of that story is true, is it, Carl? No. I made it all up because I crave attention.